Oh. Hello. Y'all have a good Hi, week. Hi, Monte. <laughs> you have a good week? Yes. Since I saw you last, lots of smiles, lots of laughs, having fun and sitting. Yeah. Yes. Lots of sitting. Lots of sitting. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, I was at a toss up of which sutta to give you, and this one won out the Anaphthanpendika Sutta. Now, this is a sutta that the Buddha gave to Anaphthanpendika when he was on his deathbed. Now, you might think, well, I don't need that. Nobody, nobody I know is on a deathbed. But there's a lot of very interesting and illuminating insights into the sutta. So I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to read part of it a second time. So... Thus, as I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. Now, on that occasion, the householder, Anathan Pendika, was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. When he addressed a certain monk thus, Come, good man, go to the Blessed One, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet, <coughs> and say, Venerable sir, the householder Anathan Pendika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the feet of the blessed at, at the feet of the blessed one. Then go to the venerable Sariputta, pay homage to him in my name with your head at his feet and say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anathan Pendika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the feet of the Venerable Sariputta. Then it would be good, Venerable Sirs, if the Venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder Anathan Pendika and out of compassion. Uh, Anathan Pendika, his teacher monk was Sariputta because he didn't want to take away the time from the Buddha. So he turned into one of his favorite uh, teachers. Yes, sir, the man replied. He went to the Blessed One after paying homage to the Blessed One, sat down at one side and delivered this message. Then he went to the Venerable Sariputta. After paying homage to the Venerable Sariputta, he delivered his message saying, it would be good, Venerable Sir, if Venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder Anathan Pendika out of compassion. The Venerable Sariputta consented in silence. He just went, okay. Then the Venerable Sariputta dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went to the residence of the householder Anathan Pandika with, with the Venerable Ananda as his attendant. Ananda was uh, attending to a lot of the arahats. Anytime they went out, if they didn't want to go out alone, and quite often they, they preferred to have another monk with them, he would go out with them. 
So he had pretty full days of taking care of things in, in the monastery as well as attending monks whenever they wanted to go out. Now at that time, he was not an arahat. He didn't become an arahat until after the Buddha had passed away. He was a sotapanna. He'd become a sotapanna very early on in his time as with the Sangha. But then he became the Buddha's attendant and he didn't have time to do a lot of meditation. Now there's, there's a belief that most monks spend their time doing meditation and it's just not true. A lot of the monks don't do that. They spend their time studying and uh, taking care of the monastery and, and helping people whenever they come. Only about 5% of the monks, and that might even be a high percentage of monks actually do meditation. There's a lot of talk about meditation and a lot of people, a lot of monks that don't practice meditation still teach meditation. And that's where things can become very confusing and uh, uh, some of the ways of practice become few confusing for other people that are practicing with them. Now I'm starting to develop quite a few people that I've have sent them uh, it's kind of like a diploma. It's an acknowledgement of their past practice. And they have my blessings to teach. And this is happening in a lot of different countries. The only requirement you have if you want to be the teacher, a teacher is you have to be successful with your meditation and be able to explain it. And you mention the six R's often. That's the only requirements, so. <clears throat> Having gone there, he sat down at a seat made ready and said to the venerable householder, I hope you're getting well, householder. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding, not increasing, and that their subsiding, not their increase is, is apparent. Venerable Sariputta, I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase, not their subsiding, is apparent. Just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword, so too violent winds cut through my head. I'm not getting well. Just as a strong man we're tightening a, a tough leather strap around my head as a headband, so too there are violent pains in my head. I'm not getting well. Just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve out 
or car carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too violent winds are carving up my belly. I am not getting well. Just as if two strong men were sub to seize a weaker man by the arms and roast him over a fire pit of hot coals. So too is the violent burning in my body. I'm not getting well. I'm not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase, not their subsiding, is apparent. Now, this is the part that I really want you to be attentive to and let it sink in, because there's going to be a lot of repeating with this. This is very similar to the repeating of uh, the six sets of six. You should train thus, I will not crave and cling to the I, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the I. You should train thus, I will not cling and crave to the ear, and, <clears throat> and my consciousness will not be dependent on the ear. I will not crave and cling to the nose, and my nose will not be dependent on the, uh, my consciousness will not be dependent on the nose, excuse me. I will not crave and cling to the tongue, and my consciousness will not be dependent upon the tongue. I will not crave and cling to the body, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. I will not crave and cling to mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind. Thus you should train. You should train thus. I will not crave and cling to forms, and my consciousness will not be dependent on forms. I will not crave and cling to sounds, and my consciousness will not be dependent on sounds. I will not crave and cling to odors, and my consciousness will not be dependent upon odors. I will not crave and cling to flavors, and my consciousness will not be dependent on flavors. I will not crave and cling to tangibles, and my consciousness will not be dependent on tangibles. I will not crave and cling to mind objects, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind objects. Thus, you should train. Keep these in mind all, all the time with your daily activities. To, to you start depending on your mind objects too much and it turns into a distraction and you start thinking about other things. So you can use uh, your um, six R's and remind yourself what's really important. So letting go of the craving. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to I consciousness. And my consciousness will not be dependent on I consciousness. I will not crave and cling to ear consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on your consciousness. 
simple thing is this is a reminder to sharpen your mindfulness so you're in observation mode without identifying with these different uh, objects. I will not crave and cling to the ear consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on ear consciousness. I will not crave and cling to nose consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on nose consciousness. I will not crave and cling to tongue consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on tongue consciousness. I will not crave and cling to body consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on body consciousness. I will not crave and cling to mind consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind consciousness. Thus, you should train. You should train thus. I will not crave and cling to eye contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on eye contact. I will not crave and cling to ear contact and my consciousness will not be dependent upon ear contact. I will not crave and cling to nose contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on nose contact. I will not crave and cling to tongue contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on tongue contact. I will not crave and cling to body contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on body contact. I will not crave and cling to mind contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind contact. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of eye contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of eye contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of ear contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on to, to the feeling born of ear contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of nose contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of mo nose contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of tongue contact and I my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of tongue contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of body contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of body contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of mind contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of mind contact. When people are doing meditation, one of the things that seems to catch people and get caught in their, in their hindrances is getting involved with mind contact. What does that mean? That means you, you have some little thing starting to come up. You don't catch it when it first arises and you let it get full blown and then you keep your attention on it. And then you come and complain to me that my mind is so full of restlessness. Well, these hindrances, when they come up, 
they come up for a very specific reason. Because of breaking a precept in the past and the guilty feeling of breaking that precept. And then trying to slough it off like it's nothing, but your mind holds on to that. And it will start arising as soon as that um, slight movement of mind's attention away from your object of meditation occurs. Now you hear me talk a lot about smiling and the more you smile during the day, now I don't necessarily mean a physical smile, but smiling in your mind, the more you smile, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. The sharper your mindfulness becomes, the easier it is to see hindrances when you're on your object of meditation. See, it's all interconnected. And making a big deal out of whatever arises. My curiosity comes up and says, oh, I got to check this out. This has got to be something that uh, I've, I've got to inspect. No, you don't. It's just more grist for the mill. It's just more ways that your mind gets its energy to bring up distractions. So the more you can use the six R's, the more you can smile and have an uplifted feeling for the day, the easier it is to recognize when disturbance occur. And to use the six R's with that, so you see, you let go of the personal nature of that distraction and you start seeing things as they actually are. You don't have a lot of disturbance of thinking this and that, you're, you're able to observe better and longer, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. So, what's the key to the meditation? Being able to recognize when you have a disturbance, don't fight with the disturbance. Don't stay with the disturbance. Don't get caught up in the story of the, of the disturbance. Any slight movement away from attentive observation of your object of meditation, e even a little tiny slight movement has a tendency to pull your attention to it. And you need to recognize that as soon as possible so that your mindfulness is sharp and you can relax, not keep your attention on any kind, any part of the disturbance at all. Not at all. Then come back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation for as long as you possibly can. If you get into the habit of staying with the object of meditation for a minute or two, 
and it doesn't go any longer, you have to start looking at that and saying, why? Why aren't I progressing? What do I have to do to, um, to get better at doing this? Ask your intuition. Ask that little quiet voice in your mind that's always right. So, when you do that, you will get an answer and then you can adjust. But you have to be willing to adjust. Not just wait and say, well, that's the way meditation is and I'm never going to progress, so I won't. Well, that's true, you won't. Because you're not taking an interest in going deeper and seeing how mind's attention actually does work and seeing the impersonal nature of everything. Everything in your life, everything in the world is changing and it's unsatisfactory because there's always the chance of hindrances coming up and seeing the impersonal nature of it. This is a process. We take it all personally and we think it's me, it's mine. But no, it's just part of a process. You're on the wheel of sansara because of breaking precepts. That's the cause of karma and how karma works. Now, as you start purifying your mind more and more for longer periods of time, your mind naturally starts to tend towards that. It starts to tend towards the wholesome mind. And it starts coming up more often. And then you get to see the magic of being alive. Because life is going to surprise you in so many fun and positive ways. In ways that you don't expect. And that makes you happy. And you naturally have a tendency to practice your generosity. You see somebody that needs a hand with something, well, yeah, help them. I've, I've given you the example of some of the things that have happened to me. I've, I've gone into a store and there was a little, a little woman, a short woman, that wanted something on a top shelf. And this was at Walmart and they have pretty high shelves. So I asked her if that's what she wanted. And yeah, so I gave it to her. And the smile she gave me was worth it by a lot. It was really wonderful. And then I got some other candy by just walking down an aisle and a woman or a man, I don't remember what gender he was, uh, looked up to me and gave me a big smile for no reason. Wow, that's really something. And it's a, the reminder for me to give it back, to help other people to relieve their suffering. That's why we're here. And it all stems back to your daily practice 
and mindfulness and what you do with that in your daily practice. You see your mind starting to run, run across stuff and, and repeat thoughts. Well, guess who has an attachment? Guess who's causing themselves suffering? Guess who's causing a big problem for themselves, but they want to blame other people for their suffering and you can't. It all depends on you and your uh, perspective of life. And you'll find too that your friends start to change as you go deeper and deeper in the meditation and your perspective changes. They don't feel as comfortable around you as they used to. But new friends come and they feel completely comfortable with you. So this is one of the things that can happen. You start, the people that are unwholesome, they just don't come around as often. I had a cousin that, he was in and out of, of jail a lot. And I went to a family uh, meal and I saw that he was suffering and I started radiating loving kindness to him. He got up and left the room. He couldn't stand being around something that was so wholesome. And of course, I've told you the story about going to a party where they were breaking precepts with drugs and alcohol. And there was, oh, maybe 20 people in the room and we're sitting around talking. I started radiating loving kindness because they, what they were talking about was no interest to me at all. And they all got up and went into another room. And I was sitting there by myself in a party in the main room and nobody was there. So I started thinking, well, I might as well leave. Why be here? And just as I started to get up, a woman from the other, the, that went into the other room came back and we started talking. And we started talking about uplifting, happy things. And then before long, there was three or four other people that came into the room and we had a great time. We had great fun discussing things and learning from each other. Now they were ones that they were with a mate, whether they were married or not, I have no idea, but they, they had come together and one of them decided they wanted to do the drugs and stayed in that room. And, and the other one got kind of bored with it and came into the room that I was in and we, were, we just had fun talking. That's how this turns into a protection for you. If somebody comes at you, even if you're in a crowd and they're very angry type and they start causing a problem with you in one way or another, all you have to do is start radiating loving kindness to them, they'll leave. They'll go away. They don't want to be around that at all. So it's a, um, this is a protection for you and a protection for your observation mind and your mindfulness. So the more you can get into the observation of mind with your daily activities as well as with your sitting, your sitting is a quiet time where you can really go in deeper and watch what's happening. So I lost my place where I was gonna. Uh, is, uh, okay. So 
householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to the base of infinite space. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of infinite space. I will not crave and cling to the base of infinite consciousness. And my consciousness will not be dependent on infinite consciousness. I will not crave and cling to nothingness and my consciousness will not be dependent on nothingness. I will not crave and cling to the base of neither perception nor non-perception and my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Householder, you should train thus, I will not crave and cling to this world and my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not crave and cling to the world beyond and my consciousness will not be dependent on the, the world beyond. You should train thus, I will not crave and cling to what is seen and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is seen. I will not crave and cling to what is heard and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is heard. I will not crave and cling to what is sensed and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is sensed. I will not crave and cling to what is cognized and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is cognized. I will not crave and cling to what is encountered and I will not crave and cling to what is encountered. I will not crave and cling to what is sought after and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is soft after. I will not crave and cling what is examined by mind and my consciousness is not dependent on what is examined by mind and my consciousness will not be dependent on that. When this was said, the householder Anathan Pindiko wept and shed tears. Then the venerable Ananda asked him, are you foundering householder? Are you sinking? Now we're gonna get into something that I'm not sure is a correct translation. I'll let you decide for yourself. I'm not foundering venerable Ananda. I'm not sinking, but although I have long waited upon the teacher and the monks worthy of esteem, never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. Now the reason he didn't hear, he, he didn't just sit down and listen to a sutta. He was always taking care of somebody one way or another. I have to do this for them. They need some water over here and I'll go get that. So he was having broken. So he never heard this sutta in uh, continuous. Such a talk on the, the, the Dhamma. This is the statement that I, I'm not sure about. Such a talk on the Dhamma householder is not given to lay people clothed in white. I don't see that at all because that would imply that there is a hidden teaching and the Buddha's teaching is not hidden. Such a talk on the Dhamma is given only to those who have gone forth. Now I can, I can take this in a variety of different ways, thinking that they don't give this, 
this specific way of of reciting the sutta to uh, laymen, but the monks are still going to give them that information just in a different way. That might be what is right. I don't know. But to just say flat out, uh, people in white clothes, that means the layman, they, they're not going to understand it. And um, there was a lot of people during the time of the Buddha that were Sotapanas and laymen and Saktagamis and they were laymen and Anagamis and they were laymen and they certainly would be able to understand a sutta like this without any other explanation. They would understand. So it, it, it must be I, I've never had a chance to talk to Bhikkhu Bodhi about this particular sutta. And I, it might be just the misunderstanding that he has. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not criticizing him for that at all. I mean, his, his translations by and large are great, but they're not exactly as perfect as they could be. For example, he only put, I am not, uh, I am not clinging. I add craving and clinging because I think that's a more, more in line with what he's actually saying. But that's my opinion. And Bhikkhu Bodhi is much more uh, he tries to get as close to his translations as he possibly can. And I get more into the practical applications of what the suttas say. And I, I change words and I, so that they'll be easier to understand. And I'll uh, add words like I just did with the sutta. And neither one of us is 100% correct. So please don't take this as any form of criticism for what he's done, because he has done magnificent work. And I would never, I, I can have talks with him about agreeing to disagree. And we both have a different opinion, but we don't lose respect towards each other. And this is super important to me. I have the highest respect for him. Well then, Venerable Sariputta, let such a talk on the Dhamma be given to lay people clothed in white. There are clansmen with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away through not hearing such a talk on the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. And this is kind of an amazing phenomena because people will They'll start out by doing some meditation. They're not, they're doing one form or another, not particularly progressing as fast as a lot of you do. But then they try to pick up the suttas. They'll buy a brand new Majjhima Nikaya because that's, that's my favorite book. And they won't even break the plastic on it because they're not ready to grasp what the Buddha's talking about. Now, when I first started uh, teaching in this country, uh, nobody was doing any reading. Reading of the suttas, they just didn't understand them. 
But the thing that's kind of an amazing phenomena is as you go through your meditation and you gain more and more insight to how the process works in you, then you pick up the suttas and you open it up and you can pretty much understand what the Buddha is getting, getting around. One of the things that people used to say, well, what sutta should I read? Well, it depends on you. But a fun game with the Majjhima Nikaya is just open it up at random to a sutta and then read it. It will give you benefit. That's the nature of the suttas. It will teach you something. But if you don't have the direct experience of the meditation, it doesn't work as well as it could. So when I first came to America, nobody was reading the suttas. And uh, I used to give talks that were an hour and a half to two hours long because that's the way I was trained in Asia. And you should have heard the complaints. And then there was the quoting someone else's book about what the Buddha thought, which isn't necessarily true. So I told, I told all of my students, I don't want you to read anything, including the newspaper, for a year. All I want you to do is listen to Dhamma talks and practice that, that kind of meditation. And before long, I was starting to cut back. I, I still talk a long time, I understand that. But I uh, started cutting down the time that I would uh, give a Dhamma talk. But a lot of it depends on the audience, on how long I give a Dhamma talk. If I see everybody's getting it fairly easy, fairly quickly, then I have a tendency to cut it down a little bit shorter. But sometimes I get carried away and give a, give a two and a half hour Dhamma talk. It does happen. <laughs> anyway, reading the Dhamma talks and reading the suttas now that you have done enough meditation and you've been somewhat successful and you've gotten into at least the Brahma Viharas, which is major steps, you will be able to figure out what the Buddha is talking about, even with some, some statements. Okay. Then after giving a householder in a thin pindika this advice, the venerable Sariputta and venerable Ananda rose from their seats and departed. Soon after they had left, the householder in a thin pindika died and reappeared in the Tusita heaven. The Tusita heaven, one day, in the Tusita heaven is the equivalent of 400 years human time. So at last, that, that heavenly realm is gonna last for a real long time. And that's where the future Buddha Maitreya is residing right now. And my teacher, Saida Usilananda, 
he is in that heavenly realm, which only makes sense. He, he would want to be reborn there so he could be around a, a Buddha and maybe become, in a future, become one of his chief disciples. Who knows? But uh, there are other heavenly realms that you can be reborn in. Some of them, they last a lot longer. One day in the highest Brahma Loka is equivalent to 1500 years in human form. And each one of these, they all live to be about 100 years old but it, it extends quite, quite a bit, as you can see. Uh, the, the lowest is, is the earthbound devas, and they, uh, one, one day there is equivalent to 50 years here. But you, you hear about uh, some people that are doing gardening and, and growing things and they depend on the earthbound devas. They're, they can communicate with them and get ideas how to make things better and how to cut down on insects and stuff eating their plants. So. Then when the night was advanced, Anathan Pendika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Jetta's grove. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Blessed One in stanza. Oh, blessed is this Jetta's grove. He's the one that gave it to the Sangha, the Buddha and the Sangha. Dwelt in by such sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of Dhamma, the fount of all my happiness. By action, knowledge and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these mortal mortals purified, not by lineage or by wealth, therefore a wise person who sees what truly le leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it Sariputta has reached the peak of, in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways. Any monk who has gone beyond at best can only equal him. That's what the young Anathan, the young God Anathan Pantika said, and the teacher approved. Then the young god Anathan Pendika thinking, the teacher has approved of me. He paid homage to the blessed one, keeping him on his right. He vanished at once. When the night had ended, the, the blessed one addressed the monks thus, monks last night, when the night was well advanced. There came to me a certain young God of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of Jetta's grove. After paying homage to me, he, said, he stood at one side and addressed me with these verses that I just read. That is what the, the young God said. Then the young God thinking, the teacher has approved of me paid homage to me and keeping me on his right has vanished at once. When this was said, the venerable Ananda said to the blessed one, surely venerable, venerable sir, that young God must have been Anathan Pandika. 
where the householder Anathan Pandika had perfect confidence in the venerable Sariputta. Good, good Ananda, you have deduced the right conclusion. The God, young God was Anathan Pandika, no one else. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So I was going to read a, a part of the sutta again, but I see I'm starting to run out of time. So I'm not going to do that but go back over in, in, in your own time from section number five until uh, section number 14. I would highly recommend memorizing this. And um, I have worked for hospice. I have been around a lot of people that have died. And I wish that I would have had uh, this sutta at that time. It would have been very helpful to have people, they, they would have a very uplifted mind after hearing this, if they understand a little bit about what the Buddha's teaching is, is about. So if you memorize it, you happen to be around someone that is suffering one way or another. This can help relieve the suffering if you recite that to them or read it to them. So I have been talking for a long time. Your turn. Do you have any questions? It's amazing how quiet it gets when I say that. Hello, Bhante. Hello. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good today. Thank you. How are you? Good. Okay. Um, I forgot one question yesterday. Okay. May I ask it uh, now? Sure. sure. Um, so if a student is, is um, working with a, a meditation object in retreat, and at the end of the retreat, they, they're working with a certain object, after the retreat, do they begin their meditations now from that object going forward, or oh, do I they hold back? I, I thought I explained that to you. Once you get off retreat, you're in charge of what you do. If okay. You feel, if you feel like you want to continue on like you were in the retreat, that's up to you. If you ran across a situation where you would think that radiating loving kindness to someone is an advantage for, for both you and them, then do that. Okay. Yeah, my experience has been that um, after a time, maybe a couple of weeks or three weeks, I found in the past that like if I were radiating in six directions with equanimity, for example, that I was really doing loving, it felt like loving kindness after I like, Faded. Yeah. It take me time. Yeah, it, it will fade because you're not doing it as intensively. Okay. Understood. And what I would suggest is you, that you sit no less than one hour a day and start by doing loving kindness, and then your mind will jump to the equanimity when it's ready. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So have fun. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. <laughs> Anybody else? Quiet group. Bhante. Yes. Um, Bhante, I don't know if this question is too broad. Um, I've read different things about 
uh, instant and gradual enlightenment, enlightenment, but I've always found it really confusing. Um, would you be able to help explain? Well, the word enlightenment, I have a lot of problems with. Because enlightened infer, infers that you're learning something that you didn't know before. So if I tell you the right direction to go to some place, I've enlightened you to get there. So it's, it's really too broad a word. What instant awakening, I suppose it could, could happen. I mean, it happened pretty quick for Sariputta and Mogalana both, but that's very highly unusual. Now, I had a, a person come to Malaysia. They had done meditation different kinds before they ever ran across what I was teaching. And they were real serious with it. And they, they did a lot of heavy duty practice. When he came and started doing TWIM with me, in one day, he became a Sotapanna but it's because of all of the work that he did before. So it's hard to tell, you know, what, what is instant. And out of however many students I have, it's happened one time. So that gives you an idea. And it depends on what you've been doing before and how ready your mind is to do it. Now, during the time of the Buddha, there was a lot of people that uh, it was fairly instantaneous, but in their past lifetime, they had done a lot of practice. So it's, it's whether you've done your your due diligence in this lifetime or a past lifetime, you still can have pretty fast awakening. And it all depends on you, on the individual. That's about the only answer I can really give you for that. I, I don't, uh, I haven't run across too many people that they, they claim to be awakened in one way or another, but they don't keep their precepts very well. So it makes me consider that they, they're, they've done a different kind of practice. Maybe there's advantage to it sometime later in, in their life, or maybe it's uh, just some kind of Twinkie experience. I don't know, but I generally, I don't wind up being around those kind of people very often or for very long. I don't, I don't want to get into arguments about, well, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. So I wind up not, not talking as much as I could as other people, they, they do. Yeah. Dante, if I can just mention to add to what Gary was just asking, I, you know, I was in Rachel O'Brien's class and yeah. just recently this question came up and I think he, Gary may have been asking it from a slightly different angle, the difference between gradual awakening and instant awakening is the difference between learning through wisdom and putting that wisdom into practice so we gain understanding and that's a gradual method as opposed to using a koan for example and so that understanding I, I, of a koan it gives you a flash is, let, let me tell you about a koan okay you can't go any higher than the first jhana with a koan okay. because you're verbalizing in your mind so I have some real problems with some of the, quote, instant enlightenment kind of ideas that they don't, they're not the same kind of practice. They, they might have 
an enlightening experience, but it's not a true awakening experience. And like I said, this man that came to me, he'd been doing 10 years intensive meditation. He had developed not so much wisdom, but he had developed his concentration to a very fine degree. So, and this is what happened during the time of the Buddha. That they had, he had a lot of uh, ascetics coming to him and they just listened to what he said and started practicing it while he was, they were listening and became arahats. Well, that's because of all the work they did before seeing the Buddha. And, and you would say, well, that was instant enlightenment, but was it? No, because of the work they did before. You got to get the, you got to put the work in. So there's, there's no such a thing as instant enlightenment as far as I can see. Because there's always work done before and understanding that might just need to be tweaked a little bit and then they understand and then maybe they become awakened. Well, if that happens in one day, great. But it wasn't an in, uh, instant enlightenment. Okay. Elizabeth has her hand up. Okay. Elizabeth? Um, Bhante, in, in verse 13, where is it? In verse 14, uh, where I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, right. and examined by the mind. Um, I added all the rest to that. Yeah. My my question is about intuition. So it doesn't say what? anything about intuition. No, but um intuition is um sensed, it's felt, it's encountered um in in my experience. And I just wondered what's the difference between what would be the um liberating mode of consciousness to not crave or cling uh, right intuition or what what is the right right in intuition of... yeah in, in some ways i'm misleading people when i'm talking about intuition intuition arises from the wholesome part of the mind and when I'm telling you, I want you to sit in quiet mind and not pay attention to anything, intuition will come up and there will be a sentence or a, a short message for you on how to adjust or an insight. And um, that is okay. That is fine for that. It's not really a disturbance. Sometimes your mind needs to verbalize something. It's wholesome. So that you'll get it stuck in, in your, in your understanding. You'll, but it only happens for a short period of time and is never repeated. And that that is just the way that intuition works. So I, I tell you, just stay with a quiet mind, only stay with a quiet mind. And 99% of the time, that's right. But there can be these instances where you have an insight into the way dependent origination works. You'll have an insight into uh, 
overcoming some kind of slight problem that mind has of changing your perspective and that sort of thing. These happen. But for the majority of time, most of those thoughts that come through are not the intuition. They are uh, restlessness of one form or another. There, it is a hindrance. Did that help? Thank you, Monte. You, do you want more? Um, it seems that the longer um, one pursues the path and the more the mind is purified, the sharper the intuition would be. It, yeah, so, it is. And so I guess my question is, if you're not clinging and you're not craving, but you're paying attention, uh, that, that, uh, that wise attention to intuition. Right. It, it will pop up. Mm. But it's, it's generally speaking a much quieter voice than a, than a, a disturbing voice. And, and is it fair to say, Bonte, that wise attention is not anywhere in the realm of craving or clinging? Right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. How have you been? I've How been have... great. <laughs> oh, no. Hi, Bonte. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you too. <laughs> I have a question about pain. Okay. Oh, about pain. <laughs> um, a couple of months ago, I had severe nerve pain, and um, it was very difficult to meditate when you have extreme pain. Yeah. Um, you know, I will not cling to sounds. I will not cling to odors, but they sure can cling to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like there's sort of this abracadabra <laughs> quality to this. Oh, I heard that. So now I'm. I'm, you know, well, but I mean, I'm glad the, for him, but I, I have trouble. Let, let me talk for a minute. Okay. When pain arises, naturally your mind goes towards aversion. And the more you go towards aversion, the bigger the pain becomes, the more intense it becomes. It means that your mindfulness is out the window. What you want to do is stay and allow the pain to be there, but not keep your attention on it. And develop your balance of mind, your equanimity to the pain. The pain might still be there, but it's not going to be as intense. The intensity of the pain is because of the aversion that happens and the thoughts of, boy, I wish it would go away. I wish it would stop. Every thought like that causes it to get bigger and more intense. And I, I've had plenty of pain in my lifetime. And always when the pain was really intense, it was hard to relax and let it be there. But as I stop keeping my attention on it, and this is a lesson that I learned from it, it got more bearable. So much so that I had a root canal and I had it drilled without any painkiller, no Novocaine. And that was pretty intense pain. But while that was happening, I was not keeping my attention on the pain itself. I was radiating kindness to the person that was giving me the pain. And that made it bearable. He still hit spots that I, it made my body jump. But I didn't hold on to it. So when he got done drilling, all of a sudden, everything was fine. 
there was no lingering pain afterwards, which I, I have heard that that does happen. But it depends on your perspective. The thing that you really have to do is change your perspective of I don't like it to I forgive it for being there. And that will help put your mind into balance. Mm. Dante, okay. I, I, I so love what you're saying. And you, you taught me at a retreat. Um, you probably don't remember about my strange ear issues, but yeah, I, do. I, I remember you told me to, for, you know, to forgive it. And right. there, there, there have been times when I've been meditating and it's just feels impossible. It's so loud. And, I will just bring up that feeling of loving kindness toward this thing that feels like my enemy, right? That feels like it's thwarting right. everything. And I'll start to kind of get very, the tears will come up and there'll be this letting go and I can meditate. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And um, yeah, I thank you so much for teaching me that because it's, it's really remarkable. It's just like, allowing it, forgiving it, and befriending it instead of hating it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. I fully, I fully appreciate how difficult it is. But you have a choice. You want to fight <laughs> or not? <laughs> fight with it makes it bigger, makes it oh. Much, uh, you <laughs> got to learn to change your perspective, which is not an easy thing. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is necessary to make it bearable. Yeah. And you haven't got much choice often. No. Yeah, you can fight it or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see that. I see that the aversion makes it worse. Yeah. It's it's a stress test it's yeah. really where the, what is it? The rubber meets the road, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, and what Elizabeth was just saying was she started to develop some equanimity towards it. So it wasn't such a big deal. Mm. I've been using that a phrase a lot um, since I've come back from India. Don't make it a big deal, whatever it is. Whatever comes up into your mind, don't make it a big deal. Because you keep your attention on it, you're giving it food. And that food helps it to grow. So when you don't make a big deal out of physical pain, mental pain, um, sadnesses, anxieties, restlessness, aversions, if you don't make a big deal out of it, it's easier to endure. And eventually that will uh, fade quite a bit. Not necessarily ever go, to go away completely, depending on whether it's a real physical pain or not. But all of the mental pains, they can go away. That's why the Buddha said, mind is a forerunner of all states. Because it is. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May the beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation.